I used to be really worried about us like ever getting a, a place to live. Now, you need to remember it, when I was in my 20s, I lived in Israel. Israel is extremely expensive. So I saw my parents basically suffocating other the burden of a mortgage for a, like a 1200 square feet apartment, like throughout their entire lives. And I was like, yeah, I, I'm just no, not, I, I'm not going to live like this. Welcome millionaires and future millionaires. You're listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast, the show where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their portfolio allocation. Now to your host, Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires Unveiled podcast. This is episode number 302. Stace. Jace, what? what's going on? What? what are you in the middle what in the heck you always ask me the question <laughs> i thought i'd uh, let you know how that feels jace what's going on you know this time of year is usually like the summer of wool but you know it's been uh it's been a good it's been a good summer so far and i'm really enjoying the tour de france right now and i'm also really enjoying wimbledon and nba summer league and a bunch of other stuff normally i feel like the summertime is like all right, like it's really hot in Texas and sports aren't great right now and <laughs> work, everybody's taking vacations. So it's like kind of rolling and everything else. But no, it's been a, it's been a good little few weeks here. How about for you? It was a good weekend. I'm looking forward to another great week this week. We got a couple uh, reviews this last week. I wanted to read a couple of them. This comes from... Bama Trader. Jace, you've done a great job to keep this going without Clark. Keep Stace. The chemistry between you two is fantastic. She asks great questions, and I love the female perspective. See, Five stars. You're welcome that I asked you how you were doing this week. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, another one said, oh my, to Fi. Always great episodes. This is my favorite podcast. I just finished the one, the ones with your parents. Very sweet. Much enjoyed. Probably should also mention I got a little hate mail this week said that the less I talk, the better off they are. So, <laughs> Welp, on that note, shut down the podcast, JK. But uh, I'll try to do better for you. I think I'm too dry on asking interesting enough questions. I've been doing this for six years, almost seven. At any rate, this week we have Orr. And Orr's net worth is $4 million. Most of it is in real estate between 11 single-family re- rentals and an Airbnb that happens to be on his property. Yeah, I make a few comments about that because I tried to do an Airbnb at one point on my property. No, no, no. It was in our house <laughs> that we were actively living in. Yeah, that didn't go over so well. No, <laughs> add like eight months pregnant or something to the equation. It was a recipe for a disaster. Yeah, I share a little bit on the, I think on the episode what, with him. Was, was it worth the $70? <laughs> no, it was 150 It was two nights. The crazy thing is, is that they, the mom who booked it for the kids, they enjoyed it so much, they booked it before they even yeah. left for the next week. You have no idea how much <laughs> effort I put in <laughs> to make it perfect. The reality is my wife is amazing at hospitality, and she crushed it and made it really good, and they booked it, and we had to cancel on them because I told them we weren't doing it again. No, it was not worth the marriage. And then we actually did have an Airbnb for a while, a different one that we weren't ever living in but that that ship has since sold so at any rate or lives actually not too far away from me and no kidding and i hope he doesn't mind that i share this story but right after we recorded the episode a few weeks later i think we ended up having schedules aligned or whatever we went and got lunch together and crazy enough he had like this crazy situation happen with his car and the tire going flat which was really ironic because Everybody that I knew at the time, not everybody, but a lot of people that I knew at the time had the same issue with this tire on this particular car. So I ended up going and helping him. And we, we, I, I'm like, dude, you should have just canceled our lunch. Like, this was a lot of effort for you to get here. But at, at any rate, we, uh, we had lunch, sat down, and, and got to know each other a little bit more. So that was, that was kind of fun. And uh, yeah. Last week we had Brian, another friend of mine actually, hit, uh, who also happens to live in Austin, ironically, but uh, his net worth just over a million bucks. 
we get into his journey from being in sales in corporate America to leaving his his job and starting his own business and traveling the world. It's a great episode with him. If you'd like to be on the show, send us an email, millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. We'll get you on the on the list here and uh, get you set up to uh, record. So without any further delay, let's get into the episode with Orr. Orr, do you want to just give us a little about your background or what you're up to now? Yes, my background is in uh, computer engineering. I used to be a computer engineer working for Qualcomm and AWS and Armis. Uh, but today, <laughs> I'm actually in real estate. So funny how it turned out to be. Wow. And uh, we're going to get a little bit into this journey coming from an engineering background or real estate. But what is your net worth today? It's about four billion bucks. Uh, I don't keep uh, I don't keep a close track on this, but I think that's pretty much it between uh, real estate investments and everything. Wow. And, and roughly, what is the breakup of the four million then? What is the breakup? I think the vast majority is from real estate. I think probably like a good 90, maybe 85 to 90 percent of it is in real estate. Uh, I have some, uh, I have some stock options. I have, uh, I have the investment uh, account. I have uh, IRA, but the majority is in real estate. I'm just more comfortable there. And and the stuff that you got invested in IRA and in options, that or those all from your previous employers, basically. Yes, and also today, from me being my own employer, I'm still always uh, maxing the contribution every year because why wouldn't you? It's like free taxes. Um, so I'm putting like max for myself and for my wife. She's also working on my business. Um, so between the 401k of Amazon and, you know, and the stuff I'm putting aside uh, now, we're saving probably like a good 50 grand a year uh, in, in the IRA. And, and are you using a, a solo 401k or what vehicle do you choose for your, for your business? Self-directed IRA, if I recall. Okay. And then... The the money that you've got, the 85, 90% in real estate, is that single family homes? Is that multifamily? Is that primary residence in, in there too? Or how's the breakup there? So I have my primary residence and, and there's a decent chunk there. And then um, the rest of SFR, single family homes. I did have a multiplex in the past and I sold it. I found out that it's not really for me, the type of people that you get there, the type of engagement, the amount of time I need to put there. It just, it, it wasn't the right fit for me. I'm not saying it's bad for everybody. You know, it's all about the personal strategy. For me, I'm kind of the quote unquote lazy investor. I want to get an asset and uh, place somebody there and forget that they exist and basically just support them when they need uh, when they need it. I'm, I'm taking great care of the people that uh, live in my properties. And I figure that, you know, you, you treat them well, you treat your property well, everybody win. Uh, so that's kind of my, my personal strategy. That's where I'm at today. Wow. So how many single family homes then? I have other than my primary residence and my primary residence is basically two houses because I have an ADU, an additional dwelling unit in it that I B and B and get like uh, two, two, 2.5 grand a, a month. I also own uh, 11 other investment properties. Wow. So 11 single family homes. We got to get into the detail of that. But before we do, I got to talk to you about the, the ADU that you've got that you Airbnb. So is that on your primary residence? Is that on the property of your primary residence? Yes, that is correct. It used to be a garage and we converted it into a, a BNB. And it is performing significantly better <laughs> than what I had anticipated. Uh, I live on a, on a couple of acres in relatively a primary location, not primary, but like centralized location ish, you know, for the suburbs. It's not Austin downtown. And people are coming here and people are always asking me, okay, but who's coming to like a 600 square feet, one bedroom ADU? And I tell them, I don't know, you know, whomever they come here. I'm very happy to host them. I'm trying to be a good host. And I have people that are coming in for like a weekend getaway, people that are coming here for, you know, uh, scoping out Austin before they move and traveling nurses. And I don't know, like just a bunch of people, but typically uh, like my occupancy rate there is just it's off the charts. I think it's my, maybe like ninety percent, eighty percent, which basically means that I need to to charge more money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that's a, that's if crazy. If you have less occupancy, you can just charge more. But yeah. And and do you manage that yourself then? Yeah, within my company, we have like a B and B division, but we kind of manage this one on our own. Like it's on my property, and we yeah, just, I would imagine. You know, it's kind of easy. And and then do you just have a cleaner come and clean it then. 
Yeah, precisely. Like every time, you know, uh, somebody, I guess, uh, lives and the cleaners are, are coming um, and, and we are so close. So, you know, sometimes we have like a close call. It, it might even be myself or my wife, which is funny. I'm like the, <laughs> the most expensive cleaning person. Uh, but sometimes it happens. But we just, you know, we will typically it's, uh, it's like within the service that we have. Yeah. Man, I gotta tell you, my uh, I tried this once way back when before we have had kids, and I, I that was the probably one night I thought that uh, me and my wife were were not going to be speaking the next day. So, <laughs> power to you that you've got an Airbnb on site because uh, I did not have as good a luck with that previously. I had one night when we had a leak in our primary residence, meaning that we didn't even live here. That a guest arrived to the property and called me at 12 a.m. And this is the one night I'm not in the property, yeah? And she's like, I'm stuck out. And then I had to like race over here at like midnight and to understand like what's going on. The lock for some reason didn't really work. I broke into my own house from the window, opened it up, apologized profusely, gave her money to go to her favorite restaurant just to be nice about it, drove back. And I was like, seriously, the one night I'm not at my house. Are you kidding me? This is the first time that it happened. But <laughs> that's funny. So let's let's dig into these rentals a little bit. When did you purchase the first one? The first one was when <laughs> when I moved to Austin. I moved here and I bought seven properties in the first year. Uh, people thought that I absolutely lost my mind, um, but it was just it, it kind of made sense. Um, so I bought the first one in 08, right? Yeah, 2008. No, 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 sorry, 2018. Yeah, yeah, 2018. So you buy one in 18 and then you bought seven in that same year? S six, six more. Six more. Total. Wow. Yeah. How, did you, uh, how did you pull that off? Or did you have other, did you use OPM or were you just, did you have a lot of money saved up? Like, how, how did you pull that off? So uh, at, at that point, in time i am probably 35 ish or maybe 30 what was it 2018 i don't know i don't whatever 30 some mid 30s um and i always 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 lived below my means me and my wife were like we both of us are not coming from from money we didn't like we don't have anything uh, inherited to us so basically the play was always live like you know two steps below your means and, and, and try to save. And, you know, I worked in the tech industry and I did some right choices with the companies. I worked in a, I worked in a startup that was acquired by Amazon. I didn't really get anything from the, from the acquisition. It was peanuts, but what I got was, that wasn't peanuts or uh, Amazon stock options uh, back when they were uh, a bit lower than, than today. It was uh, in 2012, no, 2015 when we were acquired. So I didn't, like, you know, I didn't become like super rich or anything, but, you know, I saved a lot of money myself. I got some stock options that turned out to be okay. And then uh, when I bought the properties, Austin was significantly cheaper too. So I think the total deployment wasn't crazy. I think maybe the total deployment was, what was it? Like, let's see, seven properties, maybe like a 300 grand total. So, you know, not crazy I don't know, maybe it's maybe it's not cool to say it's not crazy money because, you know, subjective and stuff. But it didn't feel to me like it's, you know, crazy, but it was like pretty much all my savings up on my emergency fund and stuff. Uh, so most of my money went into real estate. I just figured that Austin is going to explode. It was kind of obvious and people thought that I am mad, but I was like, what are you talking about? Look at this place. Like, look at this. Compare it to comparable so, cities, you know? So I want to, I want to, I, I, I know Jace asked this, but the first property you bought was what year? 2018. 2018. And that and and the the prop the next six you bought in the next year, and they were about three hundred thousand each? No, they were like around the two hundred mark, two hundred to uh -huh. two hundred uh, yeah, around the two hundred financing or how did you finance all those properties? Standard financing. It was all conventional financing. And I put uh, you know, twenty, twenty percent down. I'm sorry, 20 or 25% down. Um, it was challenging because I was, you know, I'm not I was, I am from Israel. And back then, I didn't, like, I, I barely had, like, my credit history was garbage. Um, and, and my credit score wasn't, like, the greatest. Um, but I found, like, lenders that could, 
you know, that agreed to, to work with me. I've done all the leg work myself. You know, nobody really, like my realtor didn't really help. It's pretty, <laughs> it pretty much, it pretty much like ramped up my business uh, because I found like the, the huge vacuum that you have in this real estate space, but people are not helping you. They're just like trying to sell you instead of like literally le- teaching you. So I had to like teach myself everything. Uh, but for financing, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm diverging. Uh, from financing perspective, yeah, like conventional financing. Interesting. And so basically... You bought the properties, rented them out, rode the wave as Austin started to grow and blow up the yeah. equity group. Yeah. Simple. So, or I want to, I want to kind of walk through this. I mean, you, you have this money saved up. You're super frugal. You basically are taking 300 grand and going all in on real estate at that point. Was that the plan that you had when you were in your twenties? <laughs> no, <laughs> when I was in my twenties, my I, my wife actually reminded me this uh, a couple of years ago that I used to have like not panic attacks, but like I used to be really worried about us like ever getting a, a place to live. Now, you need to remember it, when I was in my 20s, I lived in Israel. Israel is extremely expensive. So I saw my parents basically suffocating other the burden of a mortgage for uh, like a 1200 square feet apartment like throughout their entire lives. And I was like, yeah, I, I'm just, no, not, I, I'm not going to live like this. So my parents, unfortunately, didn't have the same education as me and the same opportunities, but they worked their ass off to, you know, to allow me uh, and I owe them everything and I'm trying to be, you know, a good son. But yeah, in my 20s, I never dreamt of, of doing real estate. What? Not even 20s, in my 30s, I never dreamt of basically doing real estate. It was just... It kind of clicked when I, when I when I saw Austin. Up until Austin, basically, I just saved up money and I didn't really know what to do with it. I was like, the, the the stock market was kind of acting out like crazy, super bloated. And, you know, I lived in California for six months and I was like, yeah, I'm not putting my money in California. It doesn't make any sense. Hmm. Um, so in Austin, it kind of like, in Austin, I finally had like a plan that I felt that it, like a plan that makes sense. And the good thing about me is that I can move fast when I make up my mind. But I need, like, I need to deep dive a lot, really, really learn and everything. But then, if, if you know, if if I learn something and I want to do something, I can execute like really, really fast. I think this is one of the things that, that really helped me. Uh, and I, you know, I have like smarter friends with me that are not doing as well. And I think this is kind of the killer instinct that they're, they're missing. Because you need to be able to to move, you need to be able to execute, and to be able to not be inside this analysis paralysis. You know? Yeah. So, how much do do all these properties cash flow at this point for you? I don't know. No, something negligible. I don't even care. Like it's, I have like a real estate account, and everything going is going into the real estate account, and I'm not touching it. I'm not quote unquote commingling the money, even though it's not really commingling because it's my own money. But all the money that I cash flow from real estate sits within the real estate operation, and then. I am deploying it more. So the, I bought like four properties over the course of the last like year. So it's not like I'm, I'm not I'm not really stopping. Now it's just like it's it's different financing and different type of strategy. But you know, had I had to get oh you know what should I guess I have this thing here. I can check it out actually. Okay, I have an answer. Do, do you want it? Yeah, shoot. Okay, so you know I my properties if I account for all of them uh, are cash flowing about. 4,000 bucks after everything, and maybe let's say like 3,500. It's not crazy. It's not something to do, you know, to basically to to retire from. But the play is not cash flow anyway. If I wanted cash flow, I wouldn't invest in Austin. And the play is, is equity and growth and cash flow down the road. I'm still, you know, I'm still young and energetic and I'm building my, my family's wealth and I'm working hard. So all of the real estate funds are staying within the real estate account and I'm not moving them out and then I can basically acquire more properties or invest more but I'm not in the phase in which I am using funds that I'm making uh, for enjoyment as as of yet like you know for, from this type of things I still you know I have hobbies and stuff but I don't touch my real estate money my real estate money is basically there and what I will do ev- eventually is I will start to kill off the mortgages once I want to basically quote unquote exit so today, you know, I have mortgages, but eventually when I'm when I'm like, okay, you know, I need to start phase out, I will kill the first mortgage with the cash flow, and then I will have more cash flow, kill the second one, snowball. I'm, I'm sure you 
talked about in the past. Yeah. So at, at what point do you plan on trying to start paying these down or paying them off versus acquiring more? So it, it all depends on pretty much like when I when I'm thinking of stepping down. My my hope is to own everything free and clear by the time I'm 45. It's like every time I speak, it's like it's reducing a bit. My original plan was like 50. And now I think like 45 is is doable. Um, and the plan is basically to to be able to to live that free and and decide what to do because I don't see myself, you know, not doing anything when I'm 45, but I don't want to have the I don't want to worry about it. So I'm working hard and playing, you know, play hard, work hard and, and win eventually. And this is kind of uh, the saying that, you know, uh, slow and steady wins the race. That's kind of where I'm at. I don't have, you know, I don't have piles of cash waiting for me. I need to create them, you know, to hustle. Yeah. Do you plan on on continuing to acquire more and get to a certain number of doors? Yeah. So I already reached the number of doors that I wanted. I, I wanted uh, ten doors, and I'm I'm right now with twelve, like eleven when and the ADU. So if I'm buying more real estate, and I'm pretty sure that I will. It wouldn't necessarily be for the doors. It will be for the IRR, or in in other in other words, I really really strongly believe that Austin is going to keep trend upwards until the market correction will be done when we are like 70% Seattle pretty much. And I believe that if I leverage my money in real estate in in, in Austin, and uh, the total IRR would be good. So then I can liquidate like one or two properties and pay a couple of others um, and, and I'm fine doing this decision for my family and I know that some people are saying don't bet on appreciation or Austin is burning or whatever yeah whatever you know to each his own but for me I'm very comfortable with with this strategy I'd like to take this in a little bit different direction and um, I don't Jace I don't think we've had too many people from Israel on the show um, and or I'd, I'd be really interested in how investment is different in Israel mm -hmm. and maybe the methodology or thought process, like how if that's different than here in the US and how that how you, how that informs your investing strategy here in the US. One hundred percent. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it is extremely different. And in Israel I did not invest in real estate. I I owned my my home owned, you know, I had a mortgage, but I had a primary residence. Uh, but I didn't invest in real estate and I wouldn't invest in real estate like because it's very, very different. In the U.S., everything is standardized, meaning that contracts are standardized and, and you have a lot of tax benefits for real estate and the mortgage product is significantly superior in the U.S. So there are a lot of good things going here. And in Israel, it's not really the case. And in Israel, basically, the landlord is not really protected. And real estate behaves differently. It, it appreciates like crazy because it's extremely landlocked and the demographics is basically exploding, meaning that, you know, supply and demand, real estate is kind of working out kind of okay. But it is also more volatile, like the country, and uh, not to get political about it, but it's kind of, you know, it, it's where it's at. So honestly, had I lived in Israel, I am not sure what I would do. Probably I would work on, I would I would definitely not be in real estate. This is 100% sure. I would probably be in the tech. I would probably create a startup company and you know be an entrepreneur like I am today, but in a different realm. And try to like invest my money in in myself in order to build something that can 10 10x or or 100x, uh, and then try to figure out what to do from there. But I am fortunate enough to be living in the U.S. So you know you guys are, are here. Uh, probably, I'm, I'm presuming born here. I I wasn't fortunate enough to be born here, but I'm very very fortunate to to be living here, and you know, I, I absolutely love the U.S. So, um, people in real estate, like people in Israel, I think are my type, like my quote unquote peers or uh, friends from college. They're not really investing. A lot of them. It's more about kind of just m making it. You know. So, quote unquote, not really surviving is not the right word, but, you know, more like day by day. And a lot of them are doing like stocks, um, money market. Real estate is not like it's it's different. It's so expensive there. So it's just it's 
it's really hard. And also, if you're trying to get real estate in Israel, other than contracts being a nightmare and tenants being a nightmare, um, the the country is trying to kind of combat with you, and they are volatile about it too. So one day the country can just decide, okay, we don't like investors anymore, and tax you like crazy. So yeah, different strategy. I'm sorry if it was too long of, a, of an answer. You should know what that is. That's the best kind of notification. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify. And the moment another business dream reality comes true. Shopify is the e-commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. In fact, I use it for several businesses that I have and my wife has. We love Shopify. Shopify simplifies selling online anything and you can focus successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from in-person POS system to all-in-one e-commerce and it even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Packed with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you the comfort of your business and your brand without having to learn new skills or design new code. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is, is there to help you have success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash unveiled, lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash unveiled to take your business to the next level. Once again, that's shopify.com slash unveil. And thanks again to Shopify for sponsoring today's episode. Or I wanted to, to go back to something real quick. When you were buying all of this real estate in the last few years, were you still working as an engineer? Yeah, I was working as an engineer for the majority of it. I was working as a in full-time engineering all the way through the end of 21. So... I had like this portion in time in which I had a full-time job as a director in a, in a cybersecurity company. And uh, my, my quote-unquote side hustle became like a, a monster and I closed like on 10 properties every month. So basically I had like, I don't know, four two full-time jobs. It was, 21 was interesting. Um, so yeah, the majority of the time was I was an engineer. I would say like two thirds of the properties were acquired uh, while, I was still, while I was still an engineer. And what year did you become an agent? Officially, I became an agent at the, st- the the end of 2020. The end of 2020. Yeah, November 2020. So you had quite a few properties under your belt before you even became an agent. Yeah, correct. Wow. I didn't plan to become an agent. It just sort of happened. Like people started to consult with me and be like, hey, like I want to do what you do. And I was like, you know, can you consult me? And I was like, no, that's not what I do. Like, And then, you know, another person asked and like by the time the third person asked i was like okay there's there's something here there's some type of a i don't know like a, a market or something I, again I, I was an engineer then i was like a programmer and then i started consulting so i had like a full year that i did just like real estate consultation i, did, I wasn't an agent but i basically did, was like a hyper agent and then i was like okay it doesn't make any sense i just get a license so you know i took three weekends i got a license and then you know, a year later, I basically understood that I need to do this full time. It makes a lot more sense. Wow. One other question that, that comes up a lot and I think is interesting to talk to, you know, especially those that invest in single family homes. How much do you keep in cash on the sidelines specifically for repairs or maintenance or vacancies? And how do you kind of think about that risk level as it relates to, to each individual property? That's a, that's a great question. And I have the, just the most absurd answer. Uh, I don't have like a like a figure. I don't have a dollar figure because my property is cash flow more than whatever I need to put aside. So pretty much my real estate operation, everything that I earn in real estate, I just I keep it on the real estate account. So I have money aside there that I'm not really touching. I would say that maybe like a, probably like, like 20 grand. I'm just aside. It's it's more than I need, by the way. I, I never used it, but eh, whatever. Um, I think the approach with regards to vacancy and, and repairs and stuff I, i'm not i'm not doing it like on the edge you know if, if i'm getting into something i'm making sure that i can cover it with it so i'm not getting into like a super negative cash flow properties i'm not going to go into a property if it negative cash flows i don't know a thousand bucks a month it's it's not like it doesn't scale well especially if you get to 10 properties and if it you know if it negative cash flows like a hundred bucks or 200 bucks a month. Yeah, I don't care. Like it's it's like two grand a, a year. What is it two grand a year? It's nothing. The main thing with like a vacancy and stuff in Austin, if you play your cards well, you, you shouldn't really have vacancy. I give uh, in my contracts, I ask for two months in advance of, of notice. 
and then we have like a revolving door. So basically, you know, when tenants leave, yeah, maybe I'll have like a week, maybe two weeks, but then I have a new tenant. So, you know, a thousand bucks, ah, I, I don't need to, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a figure that I need to kind of be prepared for. Just it's, it's kind of part of the game. Yeah. Um, so all in all, it's basically, I just keep the money in the real estate account and, and be done with it. Had I started like pulling money out of it, then I would think more about how much money I need to keep there. Are all these properties pretty close to you? They are within a 30 minute drive for my primary residence. Wow. That's pretty, so I'm assuming for the most part, you're self-managing them too then? Yeah. So my company does that too. So I have like a within, so now because I scaled up kind of, so my company manages like hundred properties or something. So I, <laughs> I think we're on the, the program too. I'm not sure about it. I check with my wife. It honestly, I shouldn't. I don't. I'm, I'm even. I'm not superstitious, but but with this, I'm kind of as. Uh, I'm I'm really fortunate. Like with my properties, I really don't have that much of management. Like most of them are kind of self-managed. So yeah, you know, I got an uh, I got an email the other day from a tenant of mine saying that he's asking if he can upgrade the, the washing machine, even though like it's still working. But you know, he's a good guy. He's been there for three years. I'm like sure, you know. So it's not a lot of it's not a lot of management. My time is really expensive, so it doesn't really make sense for me to manage it myself. So I'm kind of trying to phase in to phase out of it. But up until like a, up until a year ago, I was self managing it. I think then we onboarded with like my own company. Uh, we have a saying in Hebrew: the shoemaker walks barefoot. I don't know if you have it in English, but that's kind of the what we had here. Yeah, interesting. So as as you grow kind of your net worth as the the mortgage pay down all these properties i mean that real estate account keeps growing by 45 you're free and clear what are you going to do then hopefully i'm hoping that by the time i'm 45 then a my business become became like a self-managed monster and this will cash flow on its own and hopefully my content and youtube will not be as you know uh, slow as it is today and I'm hoping, you know, and you asked me what my dream is, I would say that my dream is to do education, like ed- educational content. I, I think I have so much knowledge. I'm like a sponge. I'm like a knowledge sponge, right? So I know a lot about, not I don't know, like about real estate and cars and renovations and whatever, but I know it like in a very, very deep level. And I always feel like it's such a waste that it's just in my brain. So I'm trying to basically put it out there I'm kind of, even though my language, you know, in English, my language is kind of broken. I'm not, I'm, 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 my speech is maybe three or four levels below my reading and writing, but still, you know, I think I'm understandable, right? And I, I'm good in making difficult problems, uh, converting them into like a set of small, easy problems or easy explanations. And if I'm able to have a positive impact on, on people's lives and, and save them like thousands or tens of thousands or millions of dollars. That's what I would probably want to do. Is it is it actually a, a dream that can happen? I, I don't know. You know, uh, we have some barriers, but uh, yeah, if if I'm not worried about like waking up and, and hustling and, and, you know, doing my job and, and managing my company and, and speaking with, you know, my, my people, I can have some more time to do it properly. I think I can do it. Interesting. All right. Well, let's uh, wrap up with some rapid fire questions. What's the uh, most expensive pair of shoes that you've purchased? <laughs> uh, maybe maybe 120 bucks. Okay. What about the most expensive meal out that you've purchased? Michelin star in Denmark. What was it? Maybe like a, maybe like a, a thousand bucks for the pair. No, not even. No, no, no. I'm exaggerating. 500 bucks for the pair of us, right? me and my wife. Okay. What about the most expensive experience or vacation that you've taken? I think probably the trip for, to Japan. Oh, but I don't know how much it costs. I need to convert from Sheka. Wow, it was so, so long ago. Uh, it, we, we had a three weeks to trip to Japan and we were still kind of, <laughs> it's funny to say broke when you were making a trip to Japan, but we, did, you know, we were not as financially sound as today. So several thousands, but not something crazy, probably. Okay. What's still on the bucket list that you want to enjoy? Bucket list I want to enjoy. Um, 
Wow, these are good questions. What's on my bucket list that I want to enjoy? I don't, I don't know. Like a lot of the things I've already done, I'm just thinking about like time off with with the family, like the most just mundane, suburbial thing. Just give me a minute to breathe. So it's not even a bucket list thing. So it's so. Ugh. Oh, I I have I have one I have one. It's but it's also very materialistic. But I would like to get an atom, like an aerial atom. It's just a, a silly car that makes no sense. And this is something that I'm going to do sometime. So when I'm, I don't know, when I'm, when my business is successful enough or I reach, or I reach whatever milestone, I'll buy it. It's not crazy. You can get a used one for, I don't know, 60 grand. So yeah. What kind of car is it again? An aerial atom. Aerial atom. It's an exoskeleton car huh. with a Honda S2000 engine. It weighs something like 600 pounds and it has like 400 horsepower wow. and it's manual shift hydro- hydraulic suspension hydraulic wheel it's just it's hilarious it makes no sense it's just it's it's an absolutely stupid stupid car i have a funny story about a lamborghini to tell you by the way i got a free lamborghini from a guy but maybe it's for after the podcast or oh, during i don't know <laughs> wait so you do have a lamborghini no 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 i don't I, oh. uh, I got I got one for free for three years, but now it was taken from me. So it's kind of sad. <laughs> but like, so you had a Lamborghini repo. <laughs> yeah, so it got like a, a friend of mine just gave it to me, and he was like, "Enjoy, and you know, drive it and have fun, and 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 yeah." So basically, I had it for three years, but now it's not with me anymore. So it's very sad. Oh, I just saying that's the best way to have a sports car is just uh, have a friend give it to you for a few years to drive and then take it yeah. back. You don't have to worry about <laughs> hey, it's a hurricane spider. It was batshit crazy. I'm looking at this uh, aerial atom here on uh, on uh, on the Internet. It, it looks like a like a Hot Wheels car. Yes. Like I'm having fun just thinking about you driving around often in this thing. One hundred percent. Think about the content. Just think about the content. Amazing. <laughs> The crazy car. Holy cow. Yeah, what was a key learning from your childhood? What was a key learning from your childhood? I think when when I was very young, we lived in a neighborhood and the neighborhood was filled with rich people. And we were like we were not rich. <laughs> not not even remotely. And I remember that I tried to fit in. I tried to be like them, kind of. And then we moved away from this neighborhood and I looked back at myself and I hated myself. I was like, why? Why would you do that? Who who cares? Who are they? They're nothing. You should be yourself and and just, you know, be the best version of yourself and you shouldn't be ashamed of anything. And I think I live by this rule today. I am very direct. I'm very honest and I'm me and I'm not trying to be something else. And in my business in real estate, a lot of people are trying to show off, look super, I don't know, whatever. And I'm coming to a, a $10 million listing in my in my jeans and my T-shirt. And people think that I'm like the, I don't know, like the runner boy. And I love it. You know, and then they hear me speak. They hear me speak and they hear my accent and they think I'm an idiot. And I love it, too. It's hilarious. So I think that's a learning point for me. I was kind of thinking that I should try to fit in, try to look like something else or whatever. And and I learned that no, I'm, you know, I'm I'm good. I have my I have my strong suits and I have my my weak points, but I am what I am. And if you like it, that's great. And if you don't like it, hey, it's it's on you. Awesome. What final piece of advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out on their journey? The advice I would give is that in in the US, you can really really break the glass ceiling. You don't need to come from anything. You don't need to come from money or whatever. You just need to work hard. There are so many people that are not working hard or not working smart. If you educate yourself and you really apply yourself, and I know, I know it sounds like so cheesy, but it's really true. You can you can really make it, but, but you need to work hard. You need to work smart. Surround yourself with smarter smarter people than you. If you look around and you're the smartest po- person in your group, it's not a good sign. Try to try to surround yourself with with strong people and don't afraid. Don't be afraid to commit. 
Don't be afraid to execute. Don't get too tangled up with analysis paralysis. I know it's just a bunch of mundane things, but I think when you connect them together, it really does work. And I've seen it time and again here that people are, people like me, you know, coming from, coming from nowhere, having no network. How, how do we succeed? It's not just luck, you know. It's just applying yourself, finding the edge, and capitalizing on it, leveraging it. So just educate yourself as much as you can. Knowledge is power. Or where where can people find you or, or find more about what you're doing? You can uh, you can just Google my name or dot your, or your canon. It's not a common name. Uh, you can look me up in YouTube. I have an educational channel in YouTube called Or Your Canon. Um, your canon is Y O C H A N A N, and yeah, and you can look at my website, uh, theinvestory.net. You can find me on Facebook or Instagram. You know, I have like a funny name, so you're not going to see <laughs> a bazillion ors, or is O R <laughs> that lives in uh, in Austin. By the way, my name, like the easiest name, O R. Why does nobody like nobody can tell it? No, nobody can say it. My name, like in Hebrew, you say O, and when I say O. Nobody understands this. It's like, oh, all. <laughs> so every time I need to say my name to somebody new, I'm like, my name is Or, O-R, every <laughs> freaking time. And it's like, wow, like the easiest name. In Hebrew, it means light. In English, it means absolutely nothing. So That's awesome. my parents didn't even think, think to, about it. Uh, <laughs> I think to most Americans, they, they're hearing like a paddle, like Or, and they're like, oh, you're named after a paddle? You know, like they're not... <laughs> <laughs> like, I work with a lot of Israeli companies and everything, so Or is a very common name, right? But, yeah, you know, I think they're like, is it, you just don't hear of a two-letter name very often. No, no. Uh, I had some cases that, right? uh, I had some cases that, like, applications just didn't allow, like, in, in Rocket Mortgage, they didn't let me apply because they thought that I'm lying. It's like, this is not your name. <laughs> That's and I'm like, funny. it is. No, it's not your name. That's the most American story you ever told me. So that, American. You know? So American. And then I, I, I put like O-R-R. And then later through like other whatever credit bureaus or whatever, they thought that this is my name. And I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, But, you know, or as a pedal is still better than the other hole with, with you know, W-H. So, you know, I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Maybe that's geez. also what they're think, hearing. You know, yeah. it's, you, you know what? At least they can hear or? something. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, you know, you know where to find or or see what I did there. <laughs> or you can see you can catch or and I having a meal together because we're going to be getting together pretty soon in Austin, Texas, since we just lived on the road from each other. I would absolutely love that. I would absolutely love that. Awesome. That's or the net worth of four million dollars. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for hosting me. Thanks for listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast with Jace Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website, millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.